All right, good morning. Uh, thank you to all those who joined me in the Google Meet session yesterday. Uh, we'll be doing that every Tuesday and Thursday at 1.30. So um, you can go ahead and uh, mark that down on your calendars. Okay, um, today we are starting a new topic. I know we, we just finished World War One and uh, the Treaty of Versailles, and we are going to have to go back and, and test over that probably uh, on Friday. I'll give you more information about that later. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start the, the new topic, which uh, kind of goes hand in hand with World War I, uh, which is the Russian Revolution. So today I'm just going to give you some of the long-term um, things uh, leading up to the revolution in Russia. Okay, so first of all, uh, they are led by the Romanov family. We, we talked about this family a little bit. Um, the first time we mentioned them was way back with Peter the Great, you know, the huge six foot seven Russian who... Um, tried to modernize or westernize Russia, and he was one of the, he was not the first, but he was one of the early Romanovs to rule. Um, now we're getting to the to the last few, and, and they've been in charge for like three hundred years. So this family's been in charge for a really, really, really long time, and um, they have an autocratic government, an autocracy. And that's a vocab word you might have seen before. And it just it kind of means dictatorship. It it means you know, when the government can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. Uh, most of us have never lived in that sort of government, thankfully. Um, but it, it's not a government that, especially we Americans who are used to all this freedom, would, would want to uh, live under. Um, but it's just a very oppressive, old-fashioned government. Um, there was very strict censorship, uh, secret police. Like, you, you didn't know who... Uh, you, like like they sent out spies or you know secret police out to make sure you were behaving. You didn't know who they were because they were secret. Um, teachers had to send for every student a detailed report to the government, uh, letting the government know, you know, yeah, this is a good young Russian, or you got to watch out. This guy's this kid's sneaky. Um, but imagine if I had to send out a, a detailed report to the government about every one of you in my classes. Uh, that that's crazy, um, you know. They you you had to speak Russian. You had to uh, worship in the Russian Orthodox Church, and if you if you were not doing these things, um, you were labeled as dangerous. And they oppressed all non-Russian groups, um, especially the Jews. This is um, well before the Holocaust, 50, 60, 70, 80 years before the Holocaust. Uh, they're, the Jews are being mistreated in Russia. They're called po uh, pogroms, and it's uh, basically violence against Jews uh, in Russia. Um, but long story short, it's a very old-fashioned government, a very oppressive government. Um, other governments around were, were becoming more modern, were becoming more democratic, and the Russians were... Um, you know, jealous, basically. You know, they're, they're stuck in this old-fashioned government while, while other countries are, are more modern and, and are able to vote and elect. Um, you know, other governments had lawmakers that were elected. We call them legislatures. Like, we have one. It's called Congress. Britain has one. It's called Parliament. Um, Russia didn't have anything like that. So they just wanted more of a modern government, a less oppressive government, one where they maybe could elect a parliament-type group. Um, but they couldn't because they were stuck in this old-fashioned oppressive government. Okay, so a second thing that leads to the Russian Revolution is industrialization. You know, we've talked about that a good bit, Industrial Revolution. Hopefully you know or remember it takes place in, in England, and then from there it spread to places like Belgium and Germany and America and Japan. Um, well, Russia, you know, they've always been kind of far behind. Um, they're, they're just now, you know, in the late and in, in, in early 1900s, um, starting to become industrialized. And hopefully you remember all the problems Britain went through when they became industrialized. Working conditions get a lot worse. Pay uh, is very, very low. Um, living conditions is, is terrible. Um, they're, they're working hours and hours and hours a day for hardly any pay. It's just terrible, okay? Child labor. So Russia was starting to, to go, through, uh, go through all this. 
Uh, but anyway, factories are being built, railroads are being built, and, and they're becoming industrialized. Um, now, if you remember when this happened in England, um, this guy, this German guy, uh, with the help of his buddy, they write this 23-page uh, pamphlet called the Communist Manifesto. And that guy's name was Karl Marx. And he thought that the workers of the world would get fed up of these terrible conditions and overthrow all the factory owners. Um, hopefully you remember all that. And none of that ever happened. The predictions were all wrong. Uh, but that guy's ideas have made their way into Russia. And a lot of Russians support that guy, Karl Marx, and his ideas. So you end up having two groups of um, Russians who, who really like Marx. You have the Bolsheviks. Maybe you've heard of that word. That's, that's a pretty famous word there. And then the Mensheviks. Um, the Mensheviks were more, you probably haven't heard of them. They're not as famous, but they were kind of moderate, maybe kind of chill um, Marxists. And they wanted to see change. Uh, they wanted they wanted to see the the lives of the working class get better, but they weren't they weren't crazy about it. They I mean, they weren't gonna go kill people or or do violent things like they were willing to wait, and, and gradual or slow change was okay with them. The other group, the Bolsheviks, they wanted change and they wanted it now. So they're pretty radical, not afraid to p possibly use violence. And they want change now. And they believe that a revolution could happen now and it would be successful now. And they're going to be led by a guy named Vladimir Lenin. Okay. So uh, Russia, to summarize, Russia is going through the Industrial Revolution. All the problems that come along with it. Um, two groups of, of believers in Karl Marx, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Uh, and the Bolsheviks are the more drastic, more radical possibly more violent group, and they want something done now, and they're led by a guy named Vladimir Lenin. He's actually going to flee the country, though. Uh, the Romanov family does not like Lenin, so he is forced into exile. Um, he will come back, but he has been driven out of Russia for now. Okay, so this is another problem that, that Russia was having. Uh, we've already actually mentioned this back do, during the imperialism section. Uh, but there's this thing called the Russo-Japanese War. As you can imagine, it's between Russia and Japan. Uh, this, the, the outcome of this war really shocked the world for, for racist reasons. Um, back then, because of racism, everybody thought Russia was going to win this war because they were white. And if, if you're a racist, which m many people were back then, uh, you believe the white race is superior to the Japanese, which, was a, uh, which they believed was an inferior race. So when Japan won this war decisively, it really shocked the world because that wasn't supposed to happen based on racist beliefs of the time period. Uh, but what it does show is that Japan had become really modern and really industrialized, and it showed that Russia was way far behind when it came to that. Um, and when you lose a war, who gets blamed? Your government. Um, so this is, this is another thing that you know, the, you know, that made the Russian government look bad. And this, this had a lot of people saying, you know what, we need to make a change in Russia. And uh, our government needs to go. So this is another thing uh, that is going to lead to the uh, Russian Revolution. Okay, so another thing that's going to make this Romanov government uh, look bad and, and upset Russians was an event called Bloody Sunday. And it takes place in 1905 on a Sunday. And basically you have a lot of workers and their families um, who were uh, petitioning outside of the Tsar's Winter Palace. Uh, and, you know, they were unarmed. It wasn't a violent protest, but um, they were protesting for things such as better working conditions, which would be like, what, shorter hours, more pay, maybe no child labor, things like that. Um, more personal freedoms like other countries had, like, like citizens of Britain had, citizens of America had, and even perhaps some sort of elected officials, maybe like a, a parliament type group like in Britain or a congress type group like in America, you know, a group that, that the Russians could elect to represent them and make laws for them. So these are all some of the things they were, 
you know, protesting for. And one of the, uh, or, or the generals of the Romanov family ordered the Russian army to open fire. And um, like over a thousand injured, several hundred unarmed protesters were murdered. And, you know, that just made the government, that made the czar look, look bad. Uh, and all heck kind of broke loose after this. And so that he wouldn't totally lose control, um, he did, the czar does give in. And the czar's name, by the way, is Nicholas at this time. Um, he's going to give in. One of their demands was an elected lawmaking group. He does give in, and he's like, okay, all right. Settle down, people. Settle down. Because, you know, everybody was raising Cain. I, I will give y'all an elected group. Uh, I will let you elect a group of people to represent you, like a Congress or like a Parliament. But in Russia, it was called the Duma. D-U-M-A. And... He probably wouldn't have done that, but Russia was on the verge of revolution, and he was about to get overthrown, so he's doing it to try to, you know, I guess keep the people happy or, or settle them down some. So um, it doesn't last long. I think after only 10 weeks, he gets rid of it. But anyway, to summarize, Bloody Sunday uh, was an event where hundreds of unarmed protesters were murdered by the Russian army. Okay, so the last thing kind of leading up to this Russian Revolution was Russia's involvement in World War I. Um, now, hopefully you understand that uh, Russia played a vital role in, in winning World War I. They made Germany split up its army, okay? Um, you know, half the German army was over here fighting France and Britain. Half the Ger uh, German army had to come over here and fight uh, Russia. Now, Russia got whooped pretty much in every single battle, but they made Germany divide up its army. So that was a huge uh, help to the Allied powers. Um, but as you remember, I hope uh, they got whooped on a daily basis. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Russian boys died. Um, Russian men died. The one thing Russia did have was a lot of males. So they just kept sending them to their deaths on the battlefields. And as you can imagine, the people uh, got really tired of losing their brothers and their dads and their granddads and their uncles. So this was not a super popular war by any means in Russia. Um, so the Romanov family got Russia in this war, so they got blamed for, for this war and all the losses that this war led to. Um, then the other thing is this guy named Rasputin. I'm going to try to put a picture of his of him up um, right now. So he's a good-looking guy, as you can imagine. Okay, so this guy's kind of crazy, and he looks kind of crazy in that picture. Um, okay, so the czars and the czarina, that's the, the king and queen, they're, one of their sons had a blood disease, hemophilia. And he was always sick, and it was just a very stressful situation. One day when you have kids of your own and they get sick, um, it's not fun. It's very stressful and worrisome, and, th and they were always worried about um, their, their young son. Well, apparently, this good-looking guy I just showed you the picture of, Rasputin, um, was some sort of magic man with healing powers. And, and apparently, he healed their son of this terrible, terrible disease. So, I'm not, did he really? I don't know, but that's what, that's what they believed. So if, if, if you're the czar and you think this man has just healed your son, um, you're going to think he's, you know, the real deal, right? Well, during the war, when the czar, it, the czar goes off to the battlefields, Nicholas goes off to the battlefields to talk to his generals, talk to his soldiers. Um, he leaves his wife behind and basically Rasputin is going to have a lot of influence over her. Uh, so much that, that he's essentially running Russia for a while. And that's another thing that makes the Russian, this royal family look bad. Like, you're going to let this crazy guy run our country? No way. So a lot of people were really upset that this, and he was kind of crazy, uh, Rasputin, that this guy had so much influence over the king and queen, or the czar and czarina, I'm sorry. 
and so much influence over the Russian government. Um, so a lot of powerful Russians actually are going to assassinate Rasputin. They come up with this plan to assassinate him. Um, basically, they, they give him poison. Then they shoot him like five or six times. Then they throw him over a bridge into an icy river. And um, when an autopsy was finally performed on the guy, uh, the cause of death was drowning. Like the poison didn't work. The gunshots didn't work. The, the fall off the high bridge didn't work. Um, so this was a hard dude to kill. Now, maybe he was a magic man after all, but um, another thing that made the Russian royal family look really bad. Okay, so to review today's video, um, things that make the Russian royal family look bad. Very old-fashioned, very oppressive government. All right? Um, Russia is just now becoming industrialized and going through all the problems of the Industrial Revolution, long hours, low pay, pollution, terrible working conditions, all that also gets blamed on the Russian government as well. All right? Um, the Russo-Japanese War should have been an easy victory, according to most Russians. They got whooped. Who gets blamed? The Russian government. Um, Bloody Sunday over a hundred, or I'm sorry, hundreds of Russians are slaughtered by the Russian army. Uh, they were just peacefully protesting. Who gets blamed? The Russian government. And then World War I, all the death of World War I, who gets blamed? You guessed it, the Russian government. And then finally, letting that crazy guy Rasputin have so much power and influence um, over the Russian government. Is, is also something else that made the Russian government look bad. So all of these things have got the Russian people really stirred up and they're going to force the Romanov family to step down after 300 years of rule. So um, that is all for today. Actually, I'm going to have you read a little bit of the section today um, to kind of review what we just went over in this video. Tomorrow we will do uh, another video on the last half of this section in the book, and I'll have you read a little bit more tomorrow. So today we did like the long-term causes leading up to the revolution. Tomorrow, uh, the actual revolution itself. All right, have a great day. See you tomorrow.